أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله today we are going to study سورة الفيل the سورة is named after the elephant which led the army of the Abyssinian uh, general Abraha towards Mecca when he was intent on destroying it now we are going to study the سورة إن شاء الله in detail with the historical analysis it's story time uh, previously, we've done Surah Al-Mulk and we've done Surah Al-Tariq and Surah Al-Kahf. And we've dealt with the historical and scientific um, aspects of those Surah. In this Surah, we'll do the same, inshallah. A lot of historical aspect, but also scientific aspect. How can an army led by elephants be destroyed by birds? So we'll look into it and see how it happened and what are the scientific uh, facts and evidences behind it. This is one of the most exciting and interesting stories in the Quran and is very popular with kids. So I would recommend that you tell the story and share it with your children, inshallah. The first ayah of Surah Al-Fil. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-Fil. Are you not aware of how your sustainer, your Rabb, dealt with the army of the elephant? So in the very first ayah, there are two challenges. Firstly, a simple alam tara kaifa. Are you not aware? Fa'ala rabbuka. The word fa'al is translated into English as dealt with or how he acted against. But there's a difference. In Arabic language, there are two words commonly used for action. One is amal. Like we say, amal is saleh or we are going to do our amal good amal or bad amal. Amal is an act which requires effort. The second word, which is fa'al or fail, that is an act without any effort. So it's effortless act. So very start of Surah Al-Fil, Allah Ta'ala has thrown in a big challenge and saying that he destroyed the whole army led by elephants and it was an effortless act. And inshallah we'll do a scientific and historical analysis of it and uh, see how it was an effortless act. How can sending birds and uh, throwing rocks and pebbles on an army could be effortless? How could it happen without any effort? I mean, you would have to gather a lot of birds, you'll have to guide them, you'll have to send them in, you have to give them weapons. But Allah says it was an effortless act. And we'll explain in the next ayahs, inshallah, how it was effortless act and did not require much of a planning. And then the second part is bi ashab il feel. Uh, here the word feel is used, which is a singular word. So they're talking about one elephant. And the army which came, they're not known as owners of the elephant. They're not known as the army of the elephant. They're known as the companions of the elephant. So ashab al-feel basically means people who accompanied an elephant, one elephant. And from historical accounts and hadith, we know that there were more than one elephant. There were between 9 to 13 elephants. Most people say there were 13 elephants, at least. But Allah is only talking about one elephant. And the reason is that the army was renowned for the one leading elephant, who was a massive elephant, a mammoth of an elephant. Not literally a mammoth, but a huge elephant. And his name was Mahmud. They even named the elephant. And that was probably one of the biggest elephants of his time, if not in history. And he was a very fearful sight to see. Now, Allah is referring to the army as people who accompanied the companions of the elephant. You see, like we have the Prophet ﷺ and the people who accompany him, we call them Sahaba. They are his followers. So Allah is calling all that human army a follower of the elephant. And inshallah, when the story unfolds, you'll find out why Allah Ta'ala is giving importance to the elephant and not to the people. At present, just remember, the elephant is more important and the people are just following him. Elephant has got more sense than the people. So who were these Ashab al-Fil, the companions of the elephant? Where did they come from? Why did they attack Makkah? Why did they want to destroy Kaaba? So let's go into the background. We go to the land of Arabia known as Arabia Felix or the Lucky Arabia, nowadays known as Yemen. This is a fertile land. They had a big dam reservoir of water and they irrigated their lands with it. So a fertile land and they control all the trade. All the trade coming from Asia to Europe was controlled by them. So they were very rich people. 
and in this land once upon a time long long ago there was a king and the king's name was yusuf ibn sharhabil however the king was known as zunawas and the reason why he was called zunawas was he had two long side locks so you see the hairs that come down from the side of your head and they join the beard he did not cut them so he grew them very long and he became known as he of the side locks or zunawas and the reason why yusuf was called zunawas and he grew his hair long on the side was that he had followed the jewish faith some say he had converted to judaism uh, others say his father had converted to judaism and there are even accounts from syriac texts which say that his mother was a jewish lady from the mesopotamian city of nisibis so we have a yemeni king who has converted to judaism and has become an orthodox jew and he's growing his hair long side locks so he's very dedicated to his religion and in hebrew they call it payot the orthodox jews even today they have these long hair sideburns going down and he is very keen on the religion and he is trying to convert the people of yemen to judaism and he succeeded quite a bit a lot of yemenis converted to judaism in his time now zunawas started to expand his uh, empire and he invaded the south of arabia the area of najran around 523 to 525 ad we are talking about now this najran was a center of christians in arabia and zunawas wanted to convert them by force to judaism and they refused this did not make zunawas happy so he decided to kill them all he committed a genocide he killed about 20000 christians men women babies children and the way he killed them was that he uh, dug deep ditches and lit fire in them and threw these people into the ditches of fire and this has been mentioned in surah al-buruj and inshallah one day we are going to do a tafsir for that and in surah al-buruj uh, this is mentioned as the ashab al-akhdud the people of the ditches how they dug the ditches lit a fire and threw people in it and this was a massive massacre and some historians say that zunawas said that because the christians they are persecuting the jews so i'm going to take revenge on them by persecuting the christians in my area so the persecution continued killing of thousands tens of thousands of people now one person from this area a christian by the name of zu talban he escaped and he escaped to the roman empire the eastern roman empire and he went to the caesar of eastern roman roman empire known as justin the 1st and he told justin about it and the whole christian world came to know of it and this was a big scandal at that time it was like the holocaust of its time and the christians started mounting pressure on the caesar the holy roman empire justin 1st that he should launch an army against zunawas and destroy him but there was a problem romans did not have a very good experience of invading arabia in 26 uh, bc there was a roman governor known as the roman prefect of egypt his name was gaius elius gallius who had taken 10000 legionaries uh, roman soldiers and a lot of ship through the red sea and he tried to attack arabia so the 10000 soldiers had gone through the desert and unfortunately he trusted a nabatian guide called silesius who was an arab himself to guide them and he misguided them so he took them in long long paths in the desert and took them round and round in circles and most of the army perished after 6 months uh, gallius reached uh, yemen the city of marib and he tried to lay a siege but he was defeated his army was exhausted it took him 60 days to return back to egypt and the romans decided never ever to go through the desert and attack yemen again however closer to yemen in the horn of africa just across the red sea there was a christian kingdom known as the kingdom of aksum or in arabic known as habasha today it's known as ethiopia So like the Roman emperors called the Caesar the king of Aksum was known as Najashi and at that time the Najashi of Aksum was a person known as Kalib king Kalib 
So the Roman Caesar asked the Ethiopian king, the Habesha king, to attack and take revenge because he's also Christian. So he said, why don't you attack and take revenge? You're closer. I have to cross the desert to reach there. You just have to cross water. So attack and take revenge from Zunawas or Yusuf bin uh, Sharhabil. And the Ethiopian king, very clever, he said, well, you have to give me a fleet because I've got a lot of army and I need a lot of people to go in and fight. And I, they can't cross uh, by land. It has to be by sea. So send me a naval fleet. So a massive naval fleet, a naval armada was sent from Rome to help the Ethiopians and uh, the ruler of Habesha, King Caleb, he got 70,000 army, a massive army for that time because remember the population of the world was very small at that time. And he sent a general known as Ariat who attacked Zunawas. But this first attack led by the general Ariat, it failed. So King Caleb, the Najashi, of Habasha, he looked for another general and he found a general who was very clever and his name was Abraha. Now Abraha was originally a slave of a Roman trader and he had rose from the rank of a free slave to become a general of the army. Very clever guy and a very, very intelligent general. So Abraha decided that he's going to use the ship sent by the Roman emperor to load elephants and he took hundreds of elephants with him to Yemen. Now, when Abraha's elephants went there and he got the army which was already being led by Ariat, they became a destructive force and Zunawas could not hold his ground. So there was a terrible defeat to Zunawas and uh, Zunawas committed suicide by riding his horse into the Red Sea. He killed himself. And Habesha, Ethiopian Empire, the kingdom of Aksum, became the owner of Yemen. They put in a viceroy known as Sumuwafa Ashawa. The Roman and the Greek call him Esimi Fayes. So now Yemen has three important characters. Number one, the viceroy, Esimi Fayes. Number two, Ariat, the first general who came. And number three, Abraha, the clever general who came after that. So the first thing Abraha did was... He fought against the general, Ariat, and killed him. And in doing so, he himself got injured and he got a scar on his face. And from that day, Abraha was known as Abraha al-Asram, Abraha the scar-faced. Next, he started a rebellion against the viceroy, Esimifaios. And King Caleb of Habesha, the Najashi, he sent more army to support his viceroy, Esimifaios. Now, at this point, Abraha does something very clever. There's about 70,000 um, Ethiopian army in Yemen. And he tells them, look, it's a fertile land. They've got trade control of the whole world. Asia to Europe, all is controlled by them. That was a known world at that time. Why don't you guys join me and I'll settle you in Yemen? No need to go back to Habesha. And we are going to rule here. As a big, massive army, nobody can stop us. So all the army which the king of Habesha had sent to support his viceroy, they joined him. So Abraha, with the help of that army, killed the viceroy, Esimifaios, and became the king of Yemen. Now the Ethiopian king is in trouble. He's lost about 60,000 soldiers to him. Those 60,000, 70,000 soldiers have joined Abraha. And there's no way he can dethrone Abraha from Yemen. But Abraha sends him a message, says, look, I've got nothing against you. Let me rule Yemen. I'll give you a small amount of money every year, a minimal nominal tribute, and I'll promote Christianity. So you look good in the eyes of the Caesar and everyone else in the world. So the deal was struck. And after that, Abraha, the new king of Yemen, he started to promote Christianity. He did a lot of good things. He uh, repaired the damaged dam, the massive dam, Sade Marab, which irrigated uh, the Yemeni land and he fixed the irrigation systems of the Yemenis which were broken and in a deprivated condition for a long time. Now, his reign starts from the year 527 onwards. That's when Zunwas got killed. By 530, he has complete control. By 543, he has developed the infrastructure of Yemen, made Yemen really strong and economically and agriculturally stable. But this guy is clever. Watch out. He's got bigger plans. In 543 AD, he makes a big celebration for his rule 
and repairing the dam and he calls ambassadors from the Roman Empire, from the Persian Empire, from the Hira region and from the Ghassan king, which is an Arab tribe and an Arab king in the Roman area. Now, if you look at it, all these Roman, Persian, Ghassani and Hira ambassadors are areas of trade and he misses out the Arabs, the Quraysh. So he's excluding them and inviting everyone else to this big celebration and party. And even today, there is a plaque in the Southern Arab region, which has got all this historical account of how big the celebration was after he fixed everything and he invited people over. Now, his plan is he wants to control the, control the trade routes. So he wants to control all the trade routes from Yemen to Rome. But in between lies Mecca and Medina and the Quraysh, who are controlling the trade between Yemen and the Roman Empire. He has excluded them, he has made friends with everyone else, and now he plans that he is going to attack them, and he is going to become the sole king of Yemen and Arabia, controlling the whole of the trade route. But there's one problem. Arabs have got a holy center in Mecca, Kaaba. And they're all joined and combined in unity for the Kaaba. The Quraysh hold them together. And the Kaaba holds the Quraysh in power. So he needs to undermine the power of Quraysh. And for doing that, he has to somehow divert the Arabs from Kaaba to another place. So he makes a big cathedral at Sana, And this cathedral is known as al Qulais. It's from the Greek word ekklesia, from which the Arabic and Urdu word kalisa comes. And it's a beautiful cathedral. And he tells all the Arabs, convert to Christianity. Come visit this cathedral. Don't go to Kaaba anymore. But that doesn't work. Nobody visits his uh, al kalis And he becomes frustrated. So suddenly, rumors are started that some young men from Quraysh have visited Yemen. And they try to set fire to al kalis and they tried to destroy it. And also that uh, they desecrated the place. Now, historians say that either these rumors were set by Abraha himself to get the people riled up in the name of religion, Christians against the idol-worshipping Arabs, or it was an internal job, an entrapment. So he convinced, his secret services convinced those crash youngsters to go to the al and try to burn it and desecrate it. Because it doesn't make any sense why any sensible person would do such a thing to invite trouble. And historical records say that even before this happened, the attempted burning of al or the desecration of the place, already he had announced that he's going to attack Mecca. So after this incident, all the Christians all over Yemen and neighboring areas, they become very infuriated. It's a holy place and somebody tried to burn it down and somebody desecrated it. We are not going to accept it. Now people are full of anger and he has got an army ready to attack and he's got the people behind him to attack Makkah. So ayah number two, Alam yajal kaidahum fi tazlil. Did he not utterly confound their artful planning? Now, the word kaid in Arabic means a secretive plan, secretive plan to harm someone. So you see, like all we've just talked about, that Abraha had made this perfect plan. He had first invited the ambassadors from all the neighboring superpowers, excluded the Arab Quraysh, and he had talked to them all, and he had then got the confidence of the people of Yemen by building up the infrastructure. I remember he came to power around 530 AD, and this is now... 570 AD and then he's made this big cathedral and he's tried to convert people to Christianity and now he's got people riled up religiously that their religious place has been desecrated and tried to burn down by the Qurayshi young men. So a perfect plan but Allah Ta'ala says that he put it in tazlil, fi tazlil, which means it went to waste. Now let's see what Abraha does next. In 570 AD, now this is the same year that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam is born. But this is before the birth of the Prophet In 570 AD, Abraha gets an army of 60,000. Remember there were 70,000 soldiers who had came from Ethiopia 
and he had convinced most of them to stay. So most probably these are all Ethiopian soldiers, 60,000 and 13 elephants. He had brought hundreds of elephants with him, but he's only taking 13 with him because he's a very clever chap. He knows that taking hundreds of elephants through the desert is going to be disastrous. And against Mecca and Quraysh, he doesn't need a lot of elephants. 13 are even good enough. And he takes the biggest one of them, Mahmoud, in the front, who is such a scary sight that any army who sees him are going to flee. The problem with elephants is that whenever horses or camels see elephants, they run away. And this was a problem Muslims had in Qadzia when they were fighting with the Persians later on. But that's the story for another day. So he's got these 13 majestic elephants, one of the biggest elephants of all times, and 60,000 soldiers. And he's going to destroy Kaaba. Now that doesn't sit well with Arabs. So in Yemen, the Yemeni Arabs, who are still not converted to Christianity, they have a leader called Zur Nafr, and he grabs all the possible tribes with him, he makes an army, and Abraha, as soon as he's about to leave Yemen, he confronts him in Yemen. So a big fight happens, and Zur Nafr is defeated. Next, he goes to Arabia, and the first area he comes across is an area known as Khatam. And here the Arab leader, Nufal bin Habib Khatami, he gathers all his tribe and he fights with Abraha. But again, 60,000 army with 13 elephants, no match. Nufal bin Habib Hatami is defeated. Not only defeated, he's imprisoned. And he is forced to become a guide for the army. But this character is important because later on, all the history of this attack was written by Nufal bin Habib Hatami. And he had accompanied the army throughout its travels in Arabia. Now, Abraha, being a very clever general, decides that before going to Mecca, he's going to go to Taif. Now, there are many reasons for going to Taif. Number one, Taif is green and fertile. He's going to get food and water for his army of 60,000 and the elephants. Secondly, the tribe of Taif are Bani Suqaif. And Bani Suqaif do not have any gods in Kaaba. Every Arab tribe has got a god idol in Kaaba, 360 of them. And that's why they never want Kaaba to be attacked, because every tribe's god is present as an idol in Kaaba and they go and worship him there. But Bani Sukaif have their own god, quite a renowned one known as Lath. You would have heard of Lath and Manat. So the Lath was a god of Taif of Bani Sukaif. And they have his own temple and his own idol in Taif. So they don't care if Kaaba gets destroyed or not, because their God is safe. And when they see an army of 60,000 with 13 elephants, they're like, okay, even if we try to stop this guy, he's going to destroy us and destroy our temple, because he wants all temple to be destroyed so people can go to the cathedral. So they tell him, look, don't destroy the temple of Lath, and we will help you, give you food, and even give you a guide. And now they give him another guide, which is known as Abu Rigal. And this chap, he knows the way from Taif to Mecca very well. So Abu Rigal, he guides the army towards Mecca. However, when they are at a distance from Mecca, at a place of, uh, known as al Muhammad, Abu Rigal dies. And he was buried there, but by that time they had reached so close to Mecca, they didn't need another guide. Now, for Arabs, the place where Abu Raghal died became very important later on, and they used to go as a tradition to throw stones and spit on his grave for a very long time. And even today, I've seen among uh, Saudis, I was once sitting among some Saudi friends, and uh, one of them from, from, was from Taif, and they were taunting him because he was from Bani Suqaif. They never talked about uh, the Taif people throwing stones at the Prophet Sallallahu because the Quraysh did worse things than that. They, they launched whole armies against him. But they taunt the Bani Suqaif even today about how they aligned themselves with Abraha to destroy Kaaba. Because that is one thing no other Arab tribe did. But you can understand the pressure they had with the army of 60,000 standing at their door. Even if they would have tried, they would have lost. So they decided to join him. So now they're close to Mecca. And at this place, uh, which is known as al Muhammad. The grandfather of the Prophet وسلم, Abdul Muttalib comes. And at that point, they have stolen many animals from uh, the Quraysh people and from Abdul Muttalib. About 200 of his camels the army had stolen and they were 
uh, plundering the suburbs of Makkah. So Abdul Mutlib came and he tried to negotiate and he offered that we will give you the crops, one third of the crops from the valley of Tahama, which was very fertile, if you return. But Abraha didn't even want to speak to him. He was so arrogant that in response to the offer of peace given by Abdul Muttalib, what he did was he told the army, start getting ready for attack. So they are putting up their gear, getting the weapons, getting the elephants ready, and they start marching. So Abdul Muttalib, he comes down to Makkah, back to Makkah, and he told the Quraysh, take your children, run into the mountains, hide there, save, save yourself, because this army is not turning back. And at that point in time, Abdul Muttalib says that he saw some birds which he had never seen before. They were never found in inland. And these birds were coming from a direction of Yemen and they were holding pebbles in their beaks and their claws. So the army of elephants reaches close to Mecca. They clo- come to a place known as Muhassir, which is between Mana and Mazdalifah. Even today, if you go to Mecca, if you go for Umrah or Hajj, and you go to visit these places, you'll see that between Mana and Muzdalfa is a place known as Muhassir. And this place is where the army of Abraha came closest to Makkah. And here is where that miracle happened. Now, Muzdalifa is the area where the Hujjaj they stay. But Muhassir, which is next to Muzdalifa, nobody ever stays there. And when they're moving from Muzdalifa to Mana, the Prophet ﷺ has given these instructions that move very quickly through this valley. And even today, the Haji, when they go, they move very quickly through this valley because this is a valley of destruction where the whole army of 60,000 soldiers and elephants was destroyed. So once the army has reached Muhassir, what happens? Ayah number three. وَأَرْسَلَ عَلَيْهِمْ طَيْرًا أَبَابِيلٍ وَأَرْسَلَ means to send alayhim upon them. Tayran means flying creatures. That doesn't mean birds only. So the noun tayr means something that flies and tayr is a plural which means flying creatures which could be both birds and insects. So Allah has set loose upon them great swarms of flying creatures. Now I've gone back and looked into the Mufassirin of the olden times and see what their views were about this. And most of the Mufassirin say that they were not just birds, they were birds and insects. Now Ababil, according to Abu Ubaidah, is multiple birds of different kinds. It's not one kind of bird. So there are different kinds of birds that are known as Ababil. If you have a huge collection of different species of birds, they would be known as Ababil. But we'll hold on here and for a minute we'll ask the question, how could you get birds and insects in the desert? And the answer is simple. Every few years there's heavy rainfall in the desert of Arabia and it's a well-known meteorological fact that whenever there is a heavy rainfall in the desert, the desert blooms. There's grass and flowers and plants growing all over the desert. And when that happens, it attracts insects from all over the neighboring areas. And insects, even like locusts, they would come in swarms. And when the insects are there, that attracts birds. So huge amount of birds come in to feed on the insects. Now remember, when Abdul Muttalib went to Abraha, he offered him one third of the crops from the valley of Tahama. Now normally, you don't have a lot of crops in a desert. You don't have crops at all. You only have oases where you have some green rain water. But that year, there was so much rainfall that Arabs were able to grow crops. And he offered those crops to Abraha if he would stop attacking. And the most recent time, uh, we are in 2020 now, when there was a heavy rainfall in Arabia was 2018 and 2019. So in the winter of 2018 and early months of 2019, there was a heavy rainfall. And I've got a video which, uh, inshallah, I'm going to upload on the WhatsApp group. And you can see the amount of birds and greenery which is there around Makkah. Now, remember the first ayah. Alam tara kaifa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil. We said Allah Ta'ala has used the word fa'ala, which means effortless act. So Allah had said, 
it was no big effort. He had already made all the plan. He had sent in the rain, the desert had bloomed, insects had come, and following that insects, birds were already in the region. It was no big deal for Allah. The army of birds and insects was already present and ready to attack before Abraha came. But here the plot thickens a bit. Next ayah it says, Tarmihim bihijaradim min sijil. The word Tarmihim comes from Rama or Ramat. Ramat means to attack a target and throw something at it from a distance. But that is Ramat. When you say Tarmihim, that means to continuously throw something from a distance at a target. It's like rapid fire. And it is targeted throwing, like with arrows or bullets or like guided missiles. So we know they were targeted continuous rapid fire on the army by the birds or the flying creatures. Behijaratim means with something which is stone hard. And the word sijil has two meanings. Firstly, uh, there's a word in Persian known as sangigil which means pebble made of sand. And this word was also used in Arabic. It was borrowed from Persian. So it means like stones of baked clay. But in Arabic language, the word sijil or sijin also means something which is written down. So Imam al-Razi and the Makhshari, they both have said that sijil means something decreed by Allah, written down. Like um, the word sijin is also used for this, like a book of record of the criminals is known as sijin. So the translation for Tarmihim Behijaratim in Sijil is that they hit them from a distance with targeted stone hard blows which were preordained, decreed by Allah. And Ibn Abbas says that wherever these pebbles or stones they hit the soldiers, the area would swell up with infection. And the historians Al Waqidi and Muhammad bin Ishaq. And Ikrama, they have said that at that time, there was a plague of smallpox, which broke out in the Arab land for the very first time in history. And also at the same time, there was an infection of typhus, which is spotted fever. In uh, Arabic, it's known as hasba. Smallpox is known as judari. And both of these, smallpox and hasba, they broke out among that army. And Ibn Hisham and Ibn Kathir has also discussed that. Now, interestingly, uh, typhus, spotted fever or hasba, this disease is spread by insects, body lice, fleas, and it's caused by a bacteria known as rickettsia. So now we understand why Allah Ta'ala used the word tairan ababil, the flying creatures, both birds and insects. So swarms of insects and birds had come. The birds are throwing these rocks which are damaging the skin, causing wounds, and the insects are coming in and infecting these people with typhus. And in history, the same has happened uh, much later to Napoleon's army. When Napoleon was invading Russia and he started to retreat in 1812, uh, more of his army died of typhus than attacks by the Russians. But strangely, the Quraysh were safe. Even Nufail bin Habib Hatami, he survived. And he did not suffer from any of the injuries or the infection. And he wrote the whole record of what had happened in form of poetry. And he says that people came begging him to help them and to guide them out of the situation and to take them back to Yemen. But he responded to them and he said, There's no place to run when Allah is in pursuit of you. And before this attack happened, something very interesting was observed. Do you remember the big elephant? Mahmud, the majestic elephant, probably the biggest elephant in the world ever. He refused to move towards Makkah. So every time the people were pushing him towards Makkah, he would turn away. He would move in any other direction, but not towards Makkah. And that is the reason why Allah Ta'ala has called the whole army Ashabul Feel. That their sensible leader was the elephant who was refusing to go towards Makkah. And they were just the followers. They were inferior to the elephant 
in their intellect and understanding that they should not attack the innocent peoples of Makkah and should not destroy a place of worship. So the army now has got injuries and they've got typhus and they've got the skin eruptions which look like small stones too. And interestingly, typhus is known as haspa, coming from the word hasib, which means pebble. We discussed it in Surah Al-Mulk, if you remember. So there are stone-like, pebble-shaped skin eruptions there. In fact, in Arabic, haspa means to pelt someone with stones, to throw small pebbles at someone. So the whole army is now suffering and they're dying. And the next ayah explains it. فَجَعَلَهُمْ كَاسْفِمْ مَعْكُورٌ And Allah transformed them to become like a field of grain that has been eaten down to the stubble. The word jala means to transform. So from a massive army with elephants, they became like an empty field of stalks and straw. But that's not the end of the story. Abraha survived and Allah made him go back to Yemen. When he reached his capital, Sana, the people came out to receive him. And when they saw him suffering from smallpox and typhus, they closed the doors and didn't let their king come back in. He died outside the city. And there was a reason why Allah made him survive. Because the Yemenis would have launched another army to take revenge. But once they saw Abraha, full of smallpox and typhus, they were like, no, this is an azab from Allah. And there's an epidemic going on. We are not going back to the Arabian region again. So that King Abraha, the clever and intelligent person who misused his brain, he ended up dying outside his own capital city with nobody wanting to touch him because he had a contagious disease. His children became king after him. But within years, in fact, within five years of this event, there was a Yemeni leader, Saif bin Zi Yazan, who asked the Persian king to send him some help. And the Persian king sent him six ships with 1,000 soldiers. And they were enough to topple the Abyssinian government. So they got rid of all the Abyssinian government, including the sons of Abraha and the Yemenis. They installed their own indigenous government. Imagine just 1,000 soldiers and six ships were enough to topple the government because he had lost 60,000 men near Makkah. And the year became known as Amul Field. Year of the Elephant among the Arabs. And 40 to 50 days after this attack, when the army of Abraha was destroyed, Prophet Muhammad was born in Makkah. So here's another reason why Allah Ta'ala sent those miraculous swarms of birds and insects to destroy this huge army. Because the Prophet was about to be born and Allah wanted to save the city the Kaaba and the Prophet for any kind of danger or harm. Inshallah, next time we'll do Surah al quraish and see the connection between Surah Al-Feel and al quraish In fact, there are some Sahaba which believe that both of the Surahs were one and uh, there is evidence that during uh, prayers they used to recite both Surahs combined in the same rakah. So that's all for now. That was the story of the companions of the elephant, Abraha, the Yemeni expedition from the Abyssinian army and how it ended. And inshallah, we'll talk again next week, next Juma about Surah al quraish Please remember everyone in your prayers. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair for listening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.